Hello, hello, and welcome to another episode of IRL Horror. I'm your host, Buexo, and today we're diving into part one of the chilling story of real murders that inspired arguably one of the best horror franchises out there. So recently, the new Scream movie has been making headlines because, well, it exists. It's the first movie in the franchise for a decade. Simply titled Scream, like the first one, people opt to call it either Scream 2022 or Scream 5. I, for one, love these movies. They're my favorite franchise. What I think makes them so great, though, is that they are essentially a love letter of sorts to the horror genre. And we all know, I love horror. Wes Craven, who we know as the director of other immensely popular horror franchises, like Nightmare on Elm Street, is also the director of the Scream movies, but not this most recent one because he did pass away in 2015. So we see many references to other popular horror movies in the original Scream, like Psycho, Halloween, and Nightmare on Elm Street. There are many nods to both actual things that happen in the movies and characters, But also one of the running themes in Scream is the rules of horror movies, and just horror itself. I can certainly appreciate that. Now, I bring all of this up because I've been so excited about the new movie's release that I've been watching the others again. I know many people watch horror movies because they love the thrills, but we often comfort ourselves with the fact that they're fiction, they're movies. This stuff doesn't actually happen, and the boogeyman isn't going to grab our feet from under our bed or drag us to the closet. Or some crazy serial killer isn't going to somehow be hiding behind your shower curtain just waiting for you. Right? Well, sorry to be the bearer of bad news, but this stuff does happen. Maybe not always exactly as we see in movies, but it's one of the reasons I started this podcast. Being a writer myself, I know that real events and people inspire fiction. Which made me wonder, if the Scream movies were based off of or inspired by any actual crimes, and if so, how? We often see books, scripts, movies, whatever, based off of or inspired by actual crimes, people, and events, whether very obviously inspired by or loosely. It also begs the question, does fiction inspire people to take real action, even as far as to kill? It turns out Scream was inspired by some murders And I had to go down the rabbit hole, so you're all coming along with me. Let's buckle up for this one because, well, it's from Florida, so as the meme goes, it's going to be crazy. I'm going to start this one a little different this time. Typically, I go straight to the very beginning and tell you the whodunit and their past leading up to whatever horrible messed up thing they've done. This time, we're going to start in August 1990 in Gainesville, Florida. So around 6 p.m. on August 23, 1990, 17-year-old Christina Powell and 18-year-old Sonia Larson were at a local Walmart getting some stuff for the new apartment. You see, they're both very excited to start at the University of Florida in a few days, and this new chapter of their lives as adults. What they don't know is while they're quite innocently trying to start their new lives by getting some things for their apartment, they're also being followed. This person tails them home, unbeknownst to them, and once they know where Christina and Sonia live, they make plans to return. This visit is not a welcomed or friendly one. Around 3 a.m., this person returns and uses a screwdriver to jimmy open the door. Sonia is the first person attacked. They bound her hands and take her mouth and stab her repeatedly, killing her. They then make their way over to Christina, tape her mouth and hands, cut off her clothes with a knife, violently rape and mutilate her, which included cutting off her nipples to keep, because, you know, that's something you should have on hand, then cleans her off to get rid of the evidence, and poses them in sexual positions, poses that would be shocking for first responders or whoever were to find them. This unknown mass killer then eats some fruit, 
and leaves. Before Christina and Sonia's bodies are discovered, our masked killer decides they aren't done and keep a lookout for who to strike next. Unfortunately, Krista Hoyt was picked for that. Krista was a 19-year-old who worked for the Sheriff's Department doing record keeping. She lived both close to the university and to Christina and Sonia. While she was out one night playing racquetball, a masked person used a screwdriver to open the door to her apartment. Because she wasn't home yet, they waited. When Krista did get home around 10.30 p.m., she had time to close the door and put down her keys before she was grabbed. Her hands and mouth were bound with tape, and she was brutally raped. She was stabbed repeatedly in the back until she died. Her body was mutilated just as Christina's was. Her nipples were removed and left beside her. If that weren't enough, it seems as though the killer spent some more time there, or perhaps returned to the scene. By the time the police found her, her head had been cut off and left on a bookshelf adjacent to her body. Her body posed in a seated position. It seems this mass sicko would do whatever they could for the maximum shock value and hurt to whoever would find her. Interestingly, for those of you that like to know how these things are figured out, they were able to know that quite some time had passed and her body had been posed post-mortem because of something called lividity. Now, when you die, your heart stops beating. So obviously, blood stops pumping, and the blood that is left will pool to the lowest part of the body because of gravity. And if it's been a long enough time, this pooled blood will become fixed, meaning it will stay there and will be able to be seen. Which is interesting, but also important to know how they realize this next chilling part of the story. So Krista Hoyt's body was found sitting up, but they actually found the lividity on her back. So that means that when she died, she was on her back, and on her back for enough time for the blood to pool. Now, I found two different accounts of what did happen to her after she had passed. One that specified that the killer did come back for a forgotten wallet, and then beheaded her, and another that simply says it's obvious he took his time there. So he either left, came back, and said, wait a minute, this is simply just not disgusting or shocking enough. Let me just take some time here to be more of a disrespectful ass and do some more things to this person after I took their life. Or they just hung around until they decided to, well, do the same damn thing, I guess. They're serial killers. There's no point in trying to put logic into the actions here because I certainly don't get it. On August 26th, Christina Powell and Sonia Larson's bodies are found. Christina had spoken to her parents when she moved in that week. They were close enough that they had planned to talk to her again soon. When her parents didn't hear from her for a couple days, they got worried and made the trip to Gainesville. They likely thought their daughter was just busy with her new friends, the anticipation of school and getting settled, as she should be. What they found changed their lives forever. The news of their deaths spread fast. Tracy Paulus had heard of Christina Powell and Sonia Larson's murders earlier that day. It put her on edge, like it would for anyone considering she lived close to them and the school, and she was around their age at 23. She was going to school and had aspirations of being a lawyer. Just like them, she was trying to get an education and live her newfound adult life, and she was home alone. She spent her evening talking to a friend on the phone waiting for her roommate to get back. Manny Tabota worked as a bartender and wouldn't be home until late that night. He was decently sized at about six foot two and somewhere around 200 plus pounds. He was certainly capable of holding his own. When he got home around 2.30 a.m., I'm sure Tracy was relieved. Unfortunately, she shouldn't have been. It was already too late. Her worries were valid. She had already been followed, and the masked murderer had already planned to pay her a visit. Somewhere around 3 a.m., their door is opened using a screwdriver, and the masked sicko makes his way towards their rooms. He ends up going to Manny's first, seemingly surprising him in his sleep, stabbing him 31 times. He fought back, but wasn't successful. He was likely too badly wounded from the surprise attack as he slept. Tracy attempted to lock her bedroom door, 
but wasn't able to stop the attack. The person kicked down her door, bound her hands and mouth with tape like the other women, and brutally raped her, stabbing her three times to kill her. As I was poking around, I noticed it doesn't seem as though Tracy was mutilated. It made me curious, and digging around some more, I came across someone talking about how they're from Gainesville. They said that there's this rumor or theory that has gotten around that the people who uh, called the police did so after they walked in to check on Tracy and Manny. Perhaps after hearing a struggle, where they promptly walked back out to call when they saw a black bag and blood. They say that when they got back, the black bag was gone, which supports this running theory that the mass sicko was interrupted and perhaps simply didn't have the chance to finish what he was doing. If that's the case, those people are lucky he didn't just turn on them, although he was clearly more the type to sneak up on people while they were sleeping. Unfortunately, they didn't interrupt the actual murders. It's nice to know that neighbors will check on you, though. No one deserves what happened to these young innocent people, or the first responders, or friends and family that had to find them. It's all just too much, and clearly done by someone made of pure evil. Someone who clearly wanted to shock, hurt, and destroy as much as they possibly could, while doing whatever they did for their own sick gratification. The stuff done to these people is horrific. And there's never an excuse for anything of the sort. But who did it? Who is responsible for taking these young lives? No one had a clue. It turns out that Tracy and Manny would be the last people to be murdered in this exceptionally violent and disturbing strange weekend murder spree. With all the murders now discovered, Gainesville was on high alert. Everyone was on edge, terrified and grieving. Would the mass sicko dubbed by the media as the Gainesville Ripper strike again? No one knew. The police set up a tip line ending up with something crazy like 6,900 leads and had 1,500 pieces of evidence to comb through. Quite a few of those tips pointed to one individual, someone people seemed very concerned about. A 19-year-old student named Edward Humphrey. Apparently, he had been ranting about the murders and acting erratically. The murder stopped when he was arrested for assaulting his grandmother. I believe he also went to the school that the murders took place around. All the murders happening within a few miles. He certainly was a decent suspect. So police were certain they had their man. I imagine all the people of Gainesville started to breathe better with relief at the news of this. After all, the Gainesville Ripper that had terrorized them all and took so many lives over a weekend was now behind bars, where he could no longer hurt the general public. The monster was banished. Well, they had some of that right. It wasn't until some time later they discovered, thanks to the evidence that the monster, the Gainesville Ripper, couldn't be Edward. The police had found semen at the scene, so they knew the killer's blood type. They knew the man they were looking for had type B blood. Our suspected monster behind bars, Edward Humphrey? Well, his blood type isn't B. Edward was not the killer. He couldn't be. They spent a couple months investigating Humphrey, but the murders had stopped. So who was the killer? And why did they stop after such an aggressive weekend? It wasn't likely someone like this would just stop, is it? They seem to be quite determined and getting off on it all. Well, it so happens, while all of this was going on, there was a bank robbery happening. The police followed up and managed to find two men in the woods. They spoke to one, and the other ran away. As they were looking for him, they came across a tent in the woods, a campsite of sorts. Turns out, someone had been living there. There they found the money stolen from the bank, the dye pack exploded all over it, so they knew they had their robber. They bagged it all up and put everything into evidence. The evidence included a sleeping bag, tools, and tape recorder, among other things. As Gainesville is still reeling from such horrible crimes and scrambling to put it all together, another robbery happens. Not in Gainesville, but 40 miles away in Ocala, Florida. A man tries to rob a Winn-Dixie supermarket. He gets interrupted and takes off, 
police tailing him. The scene, sounding like something straight out of a movie, ends in a crash. They apprehend their robber, and he gets tossed in a cell in Marion County, Florida. You're probably wondering what some random robberies have to do with the brutal murders of five young people, right? Well, it turns out these robberies would be the reason they catch the masked monster and get justice for those whose lives were taken. The robber's name is Danny Rowling, for future reference. So back in Gainesville, police have hit a roadblock. Excuse my pun. So they turn to VICAP, capital V, lowercase i, capital C-A-P, which is the Violent Crime Apprehension Program. It's a unit or program that keeps information about violent crimes such as sexual crimes and murders, particularly serial ones, or can be used to establish serial crimes. Because many crimes or people committing them will do so in a particular way or have some sort of signature. If we look at the Gainesville murders, there are certainly aspects of them that are similar, obvious connections. Now, I'm no professional, so take what I say with a grain of salt, but the crimes were all very violent. They all used the same weapon, specifically a K-bar knife, which is used by the military. There was always a clear target of rape, as we can see in the circumstances where more than one person was home and he only raped one of them, but did always kill both. The bodies were posed and mutilated except for one, in which he was possibly interrupted, but that was simply a rumor, although it would all add up. All of the homes were broken into in the same way, with the same screwdriver, and obviously all these Gainesville murders happened in very close proximity and in a short amount of time. While I assume that some of the stuff they looked for when they started searching by cap to hopefully aid in the case. They did have some matches, but one in particular caught their eye, because it was a pretty perfect match. The match was an unsolved triple homicide in Shreveport, Louisiana, from 1989. William Tom Grissom, a 55-year-old AT&T supervisor, his 24-year-old daughter, Julie Grissom, a student, and 8-year-old visiting grandson, Sean, were all stabbed to death in what looks like a surprise attack on all of them. The knife, likely a K-bar. With some signs of a struggle, the scene was mostly neat. They were all in separate parts of the home doing their own things. Like the Gainesville murders, there seems to be a pretty clear target here. Julie. She is the most mutilated, and the assailant did try to wash her off as well to get rid of evidence. She was also posed in a sexually suggestive position. With this new information, the police can look into who was in Shreveport at the time of those murders, and in Florida at the time of the Gainesville murders, and try to find a suspect. Remember that robber, Danny Rowling? Well, he lived in Shreveport until May 1990, roughly six months after this triple homicide, when he suddenly took off after getting into an altercation with his father. The two were in some sort of argument. His father pulled out a pistol, they fought over it, and Danny ended up shooting his father in the head and stomach. Thinking he killed his father, he took off. He had already been in trouble with the law in the past, and his father was retired police. Danny robbed and stole to make his way out of Shreveport and continued on the run. Eventually, they figured out it was Rowling who was already in jail for the Winn-Dixie robbery. They were able to finally take a look at the evidence they found at the campsite, which helped them link Rowling to the robberies and the murders. The evidence they found at the campsite... Well, it turns out, had they just processed it properly when they found it, they might have figured it out a little sooner. Hours after Tracy and Manny's bodies were found, in fact, they find everything used in the murders, duct tape, K-bar knife, ski mask, gun, and a screwdriver. The campsite is also only a short bike ride from all of the murders. They find blood on pants matching Manny's, fibers on the ski mask matching fibers from the duct tape on the scenes and Krista's pubic hair in his sleeping bag. One of the items found was a tape recorder in which Rowling's talks, a lot, but also by name, which means everything they needed to catch Rowling was right there, in their custody that entire time, including him just giving them his name. While they're putting all this together, Rowling does have to first go through his sentencing for his current arrest. He is sentenced to life for the armed Winn-Dixie robbery and then an additional 170 years for the robberies and assaults. 
so he's already put away for three life sentences, even before anything is done with the actual murders he committed. When he does have to stand for the murders, he surprisingly pleads not guilty and holds on to that for a while. Months later, he apparently changes his mind. One day, he randomly decides that he wants to confess to law enforcement and requests a meeting, but he will only do it through his fellow prisoner and friend, Bobby Lewis, for whatever reason. Honestly, I can't find a reasoning for this, but it's just so weird. Anywho, he does confess, though, through Lewis, and justice is served. As for the Shreveport triple homicide, Rowling left a written confession. It reads, In order to fulfill all things that no stone be unturned, hereby I make the formal written statement concerning the murders of Julie, Tom, and Sean Grissom in my hometown of Shreveport, Louisiana. Hal Carter, Julie Grissom's former fiancé, is 100% innocent, totally pure of that crime. I, and I alone, am guilty. It was my hand that took those precious lights out of this old, dark world. With all my heart and soul, would I could bring them back. Being a native son of Shreveport, I can only offer this confession of deep-felt remorse of the loss of such fine, outstanding souls. Have wept an ocean of tears, by which mournful doth float upon a sea of regret. Danny Rowling. I don't know what I make of that, so I'll leave that up to you. There is another twist here, though. Rowling claims that it wasn't exactly him that committed these murders. He says it was someone inside him, that he has multiple personalities. He says the murders weren't committed by the child like Danny or another personality. He says his name, Yanid. Enid. Yanid. Danny, spelled backwards but rather a third, Gemini. Now, if you're a fan of the Exorcist movies, you may see where this is going. The Exorcist 3 came out on August 17th, 1990, in the United States, just days before the murders. In the movie, there is an evil being that is blamed for the killings and mutilations of the people in the movie, much like Rowling is blaming Gemini, his supposed alternate personality, for the killing, rapes, and mutilations of five young people. Rowling does admit to seeing the movie shortly before the killing started, possibly even mere hours before. You might be wondering what a psychologist says about all of this. Well, lucky for you, I found an article. It quotes a care provider speaking to Rowling's claims of Gemini and Enid, Yanid, Danny backwards, they say that Rowling's diagnosis is not that he has some sort of things possessing him, but rather that he has a borderline personality disorder and that he is using Gemini as a way to cope with his deplorable actions. Rowling, in a session, also said at one point that the murders were, quote, like a bad horror movie. So really, this brings me all back to the beginning. The inspiration for Scream. The Gainesville Ripper, or rather, the deplorable, unmasked monster, Danny Rowling's actions, were the inspiration for Scream, but he may have been inspired by a movie himself, The Exorcist 3. Can movies truly inspire the actions of murderers? We know fiction is inspired by real-life people and events, but can the same be true for life? Can movies make a murderer? With that question, I will end this here. But no, 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 don't you fret. I am not done with this story or this topic. We will pick it back up next week for part two. I'll see you there. In the meantime, thank you for listening. And until next week, stay spooky. And please, stay safe.